but it really pretty clearly is is Christian thinkers who are very vocal, very insistent that human beings have um, a, a certain moral nature, and part of that moral nature is the the freedom um, to choose whether to to sin or not. Um, so it's it's interesting because then it gets entangled with sex because sex is also more front and center uh, in Christian ethics than it had been in other philosophical systems. Hello, welcome to Post Christianity with me, Glenn Scrivener. And me, Andrew Wilson. Uh, we have a very special episode today because we are talking with the professor of classics and letters at Oklahoma University, uh, Kyle Harper. He is the author of this book, From Shame to Sin, which is a sensational work of showing how we've gone from the pre-Christian uh, sexual ethic to a Christian sexual ethic and all that that brought along with it. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Kyle, for joining us. We're thinking about a shift from pre-Christian to Christian civilization and what that looks like. And in our episode now, we want to think about sex. Can you take us uh, into the sandals of uh, a Roman? And uh, we might need you to, to think, of, think your way into being different kinds of Romans, man, woman, slave, perhaps even prostitute. Um, if you are in, let's say, the year 60 in Rome, and first of all, you're a man, um, what, what, is, what, what are you thinking about sex? What, what, what is your view of sex and sexuality? Well, I think that the transformation of sexual morality is one of the, the biggest effects, one of the domains where the, the shift from a pre-Christian to a Christian culture is the, the most radical. And I think most of us have somewhere in the back of our head uh, a certain story. And it may be from popular culture. It may come from uh, from movies. Uh, I think is it a uh, funny thing happened on the way to the forum where the Roman aristocrat <laughs> orders a sit-down orgy for 40. <laughs> um, or we've, we've been to uh, Pompeii and maybe seen some of the, the naughty pictures. Uh, and so... That, that tends to create or reinforce a, a story in which, pretty simplistically, um, pre-Christian sexual culture was uh, all about uh, eroticism. It was, it was fun. It was free. Um, sex was, was natural and good. Uh, and then um, the, the Christians come along and, and put an end to, to all the fun. The orgies are closed down. The naughty pictures get um, locked up and secret cabinets, um, which does kind of happen. Uh, and there, there's definitely a little truth to that story. But, uh, but the, the bigger picture, the, the deeper truth is, is that that is way uh, too simplistic and not accurate. The, uh, the, the question, as you phrased it, is a good one because it, it's hard for us to wrap our mind around the extent to which even to think about what the experience of sexual life and sexual morality was like in the first century is first and foremost a, a question of who you are. And so in ways that, that are, I think, as a historian, one of the challenges is how do you get back into the, the sandals? How do you get back into the, the very different world of, of somebody that lived, in this case, 2,000 years ago? Because we... We live in a world where in our popular culture and public morality, we, you know, if you say there's a double standard in sexual morality, I think everybody would kind of know what that means. It means that there's, you know, different, different set of expectations, particularly for, for men and women, um, that, that the rules aren't uh, really enforced the same way culturally. And um, that, you know, the idea of a double standard doesn't even begin to describe the way the Roman world works because there's nothing at all hypocritical about the double standard. And it's not even a double standard, it's a quadruple standard at least. It depends if you're male, female, if you're free or slave, if you're a person of honor and status in society, if you're a person who's uh, of low social status or deprived of social honor. There's, like I said, there's not even hypocrisy. There's just simply different rules depending on where you stand in the social order. And Christianity, of course, doesn't 
wipe that away in, in sort of one swoop. Um, but it radically um, uh, changes the, the expectation that different people would follow different rules. It, uh, it, it completely changes the underlying logic in ways that make us make it difficult for us to to really get back into the um, the culture of pre-Christian times. Mm. So uh, a quadruple standard then: um, man, woman, slave, um, and this concubinage as well as as this sort of second class kind of uh, you know mistress kind of kind of style as well. Um, you you write in your book um, from shame to sin. That social standing and this um, this cosmos in which you you have a certain place to play and your position within the social order is the all determining factor um, and the great revolution is 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 going from a world in which social standing and, and shame honor um, is is king to a, a society in which um, the transgression of like wills and bodies and laws becomes like the the transgression um so again help help us if you know if if i'm an ancient person um there there are still norms about sex it's not a free-for-all um very very much not but what is determining who is fair game when it comes to sex what is ruled in and what is ruled out what are what are the rules well, you, you mentioned concubinage, and I think that's a, that's a helpful way to, to think about some of these questions. And instead of taking uh, an abstract ancient person, uh, we can take a very specific ancient person, a well-known late Roman figure named Augustine, um, St. Augustine, Augustine of Hippo, one of the most extraordinary human beings who's ever lived. And uh, a person that we know more about than anybody who lived in the ancient world, um, mostly because of his own writings, and particularly because he wrote a book called The Confessions, uh, that in which he uh, confesses to God uh, many of his sins and tells the world about uh, what a what a bad sinner he'd been. It's pretty pretty amazing. Uh, portrayal of, of his own past. And so because of uh, what he tells us, we can, we can learn about um, kind of his life and the way that this culture, the world around him, which is still, when he lived in the fourth century, lives from 354 to 430, um, the world is changing from uh, a pre-Christian to Christian world. And concubinage uh, is, a, is a social practice. It's a relationship that is uh, inferior to marriage between uh, a free man, usually of higher status or wealth, and a woman who doesn't have social honor. So probably in most cases, concubines are freed slaves. And it's, it's a practice that develops because uh, men, particularly high status men, tend to marry late, into their mid to late 20s, even 30s. Augustine uh, isn't engaged until he's in his early 30s. And um, so that's a, that's a long time between puberty and marriage, and um, it is completely acceptable, even expected, in some ways even encouraged, for Roman free men uh, in their teens and 20s to have sex, usually with slaves or prostitutes. But one uh, form of this is concubinage, in which there's just a long-term uh, sexual relationship between two people of very unequal status. And Augustine amazingly tells us that he, he was in a relationship with a woman who he doesn't name. Um, we don't really know that much about her. She was probably of, of low status. It's not a marriage because Augustine will, will get engaged for a socially appropriate marriage um, after he's in Milan. Uh, and he has, does have a kid. You're not supposed to have children in concubinage. And in general, when you do, they're not recognized as legitimate children. Uh, but Augustine does have a son, a Deodatus, with, with this woman. Um, and when Augustine gets engaged around 30, um, he sends this woman packing. Um, you know, she's, he clearly is, is attached to her in certain ways, but it's concubinage, and so it's a relationship whose purpose is sex. And famously, because Augustine's engagement is to a woman who's not yet eligible to be married, um, he 
doesn't want to go without sex, and so he buys another one. He says, procure awi aliam, I bought another one, uh, meaning I bought another woman. And um, it's, it's really, I mean, obviously it's, it's kind of horrible how, how the, the exploitation is at the heart of these kinds of relationships. But there's a very particular individual who tells us, more or less in his own words, about uh, the experience of a society where if you're a free man, um, you, you do have limits. Um, this is not a, a world where people date and have premarital sex um, with uh, other free, socially honorable women. But it's a world where it's simply expected that people without protection, people without social honor, whether they're slaves or uh, they're in brothels, uh, are exploited. And so that's a, a kind of concrete story that we know a lot about, but it's really just reflective of, of this world. How do you, as a historian, you've, you've used the word like horrible exploitation there, which like we all, we all hear that. You, you describe that story and we all hear horrible exploitation. But is there a sense in which we hear with 21st century is horrible exploitation? And to what degree do we have to go back to the 5th century and kind of hear with ancient ears? It's like a contemporary of Augustine, is, is he thinking that's horrible exploitation or, or you know, like they're processing things in different ways aren't they right, right. they they are and i mean every society has its has its field of vision has its blindness what's amazing um obviously we should say that for the most part we tend to know the ancient world through the through the eyes of the the literate classes uh, who write things down um so um, you know, we we see and don't see um, what what they see in many ways. Um, that said, of course, we we can read against the grain, um, and I don't think, you know, I think the the world of antiquity would look very different if most of what we had had been written by people who lacked power, people who were uh, who were sold, bought and sold, who were traded as as commodities. Um, and so I think it's it's important that we try and look at this world from the, the different angles, whether it's the text that we have um, and thinking about what they say, but what they don't say. What's interesting is that in the, the fourth and fifth century in particular, as Christianity becomes the, the public culture, Constantine converts in 312, um, more or less during Augustine's lifetime, Christianity goes from being a minority religion to a majority religion, to where most of the, the society um, is at some level, at least nominally, and in many, many cases um, more, more deeply, Christian. Um, that's, a, that's a sea change in religious history and social history. And one of the interesting and I think kind of unexpected um, consequences of that is that for the, for the first time in a lot of ways, you start to... Um, hear different voices, new voices, you start to see new problems. And in many cases, Christian bishops are very, very critical of the, the social system around them. And so um, they're critical of it from different perspectives. They're critical of the, the, what they perceive as the sinfulness of uh, people who are having uh, sex in ways that they shouldn't. So they're critical of people like Augustine. He's, of course, critical of himself. Um, that's kind of the point of confessing it. But, um, but what's maybe even more interesting is that um, this opens the door to, to see, uh, for them to criticize these kinds of systems, these structures of exploitation um, in ways that, that recognize the, the dignity the, the claims of people who are exploited. And so there are, at times, um, expressions of, of concern and speaking in behalf of the, the dignity of people who are kind of getting the, the, the bad side of these systems of exploitation. And this does even, in some ways, um, translate at times in limited ways uh, but does translate into um, changes, changes in social practice, changes in systems and structures, changes in laws. Um, and that's one interesting domain where we can actually follow some of these changes. Christian emperors 
in the fifth century start to get concerned with the practice of prostituting enslaved people um, and take public legal action um, in the name of suppressing it. So that's a it's an interesting change because it's totally different from the the Roman world that had preceded it. So you talk a lot about the the fact that you it began it, sex begins to be seen not only from the perspective of the powerful person but from the powerless person or the dignity of the uh, the weaker person. Um and which is all related to the idea of you know of consent and a lot of things we now take for granted. Where does that? What's the connection? It, how arbitrary would it have seemed to an ancient person that Christianity was saying you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that? And how much? Where does it? But where does it grow from? What's the sort of? What are the roots of that idea that you should see it from the point of view of the other person and the dignity of that person? Well, what, what's yeah? Where does that come from at a sociological level? I'm partly it's partly theology, I'm sure, but where does that come from, and how much does it feel like a random thing that's just come in? This is now what the new faith teaches us, and how much is it sort of more organic than that, and it's become part of the way people think about the world? Yeah, I mean, I'd say it's a great question. It's a big one. I'd say there's there's at least three or four things that are going on that are swirling together um, to, to create this this deep change. I mean, one is the the fundamental locus of the the Christian Gospels, um, as well as Pauline letters, that provide a different set of normative beliefs, and so that in this instance has sort of two different facets. One is the kind of radical egalitarianism that is that is potential in in the Gospel and in Paul's writings. Um, and that that does cut across the the social assumptions, the world of hierarchy and status uh, of classical antiquity. And second, sort of essentially scriptural um, ingredient is the the kind of heightened uh, energy around sexual morality um, that really comes more from the the Pauline letters, um, particularly from 1 Corinthians, um, more so than the Gospels. It's There's elements of it in, in the Gospels, but it's particularly um, Paul and particularly the letter to the Corinthians that, um, that ultimately makes sexual ethics um, kind of front and center in... Christian morality in a way that it really wasn't. And, you know, if you read Epictetus, who's an amazing Stoic philosopher, um, he doesn't have that much to say about sex. I mean, it's there for sure. Um, but it's not, it's not kind of uh, all that strict. And its place in the overall just texture of his moral teaching isn't, isn't extremely prominent. Whereas um, for Christians, it, it assumes a kind of centrality that's that's unexpected. So you have a kind of combination of sex is now an important domain of morality. Two, you have a kind of egalitarianism where everybody kind of counts. Um, everybody is creating the image of God. Um, and this is whether you're a, a king or a slave, um, uh, you, you count. But the the third ingredient, I think, is what I mentioned earlier, is the the conversion of a society. Um, because when Christianity is a is a persecuted minority, it has the kind of stridency um, of a of a persecuted minority. It's sort of outside the mainstream, um, and sociologically, as you were putting it, that's a very different environment than when all of a sudden you have bishops who are some of the most important leaders in their cities and they're grappling with um, large communities where you have a huge array of different kinds of people, different statuses, different professions, um, different levels of earnestness about their, their religious commitments. So it takes the, the kind of moral ingredients or theological ingredients, but it does take that sociological ingredient where all of a sudden you have Christianity as a as a mass movement, as a mainstream um, factor in society that I think leads to a different kind of, of reflection um, that, that we haven't seen before. And so simply when I was writing this 
my, my book on this question, um, the, the nature of the Christian sources in the post-Constantinian period are just so dramatically different um, than, than what we had before. And it's not that the beliefs are different, but what they see is different. The way they interact with society is different. You get leaders like Augustine, but um, his, his rough contemporary in the East, John Chrysostom, who's uh, a priest in Antioch and then um, uh, bishop in Constantinople, um, and who's an amazing preacher. And we have hundreds of his homilies. And that they're an amazing source for everything we're talking about for social history, because you have this extremely eloquent, very thoughtful, uh, very honest, very um, socially critical preacher who's preaching to probably hundreds of people um, and dealing with thinking through the kinds of problems that really exist in the world around him. Um, and, you know, when I was way back in the day writing a dissertation on slavery in the late Roman world, you kind of fall in love with these sources because, of course, you're desperate for good material. You're like a journalist. You want a source. Um, and you can, you can get a little attached to your sources. I, I probably, uh, um, probably like John Chris has done too much just because he gave me so much good material. But that's in itself is kind of the interesting fact. What is going on? Well, all of a sudden you have a society that um, is now uh, mostly Christian in some sense, and these leaders have to grapple with problems that, that maybe they didn't before. Mm-hmm. And before then, like before um, the church becomes this sexual sanatorium, as you call it in the book, for, for all the sinners of the world. Like it, Did I say that? Yeah, yeah it's brilliant. <laughs> you, you got some great lines in there. <laughs> you, you talk about how, you know, all the world's diffuse erotic energy is to be cramped into this one frail sacred union, which is just a sen- sensational line. Um, and as a counterculture in the early church, um, that kind of flies in a certain way. You've, you've got this odd breed of human called a Christian, and some of them are even martyrs, and they can kind of buck the trend of survival and, and embrace death. And then some are virgins, and they can buck the trend of sexual self-expression, and, and they can actually um, be, be continent. And, and um, chastity suddenly becomes this sort of superhuman thing. But when you kind of roll that into an empire-wide exercise, um, there start to be some different views of um, of freedom. Like we've already talked about, Augustine. Like um, in the early church, you you, you talk about um, free will uh, was born in the struggle to define the meaning of Christ- Christian sexual morality, and. In my my reading, that that was because you you had this brand of human being called these these Christians who were kind of bucking the trend of absolute biological necessity, and and doing this completely different thing and a libertarian kind of doctrine of of, of free will suddenly seemed much more believable for Christians in the early church, and then that changed as we went sort of post Constantine. Have I read you right in any way? Yeah, I mean, I think that that gets at what I find really interesting is that the the question of free will becomes suddenly very prominent in the, the second century, the, the Roman Empire, in a way that it simply hadn't before. And there's some interesting debates about whether it's essentially stoic, um, and, and there's some arguments that are, that are compelling uh, to that effect. But ultimately, I think what's very interesting is, to me, um, indisputably, it's Christians who really um, take that banner. And they're the first ones to use the words together, free will. So just like as a a point of uh, just empirical fact, as a kind of really linguistically even. um, But but it's not just that they're the first to use the words. It's that this idea um, that humans are fundamentally moral creatures in a, in a cosmos um, where um, morality, uh, where the, the, our moral nature is fundamental, is essential to who we are, um, and that humans will be judged, um, really sharpens the contours of beliefs about freedom, freedom of the will. Because in that kind of high stakes universe, um, when you combine it with the, the sort of egalitarianism that all people 
um, are like this uh, and all people matter, um, then you, you see sharpened the, the notion that consequently it must be the case that all people uh, are free and they're free in a moral sense. Um, and so you, to me, there's an explosion of interest in this in the, the early Christian church that you don't see in Platonism, where it could have developed. You don't see in Stoicism, where it could have developed. Um, and, and in both of those cases, in some ways, is um, in the air, is implicit. But it really pretty clearly is, is Christian thinkers who are very vocal, very insistent that human beings have um, a, a certain moral nature and part of that moral nature is the, the freedom um, to choose whether to, to sin or not. Um, so it's, it's interesting because then it gets entangled with, um, with sex because, as I said, sex is also more front and center uh, in Christian ethics than it had been in other philosophical systems. So it's those two things start to, to sort of rotate around one another. Um, and, of course, this then in the, the later post-Constantinian church um, becomes inescapable that Christians have to then confront what about the people who are fundamentally unfree in a legal and social sense. And so you see, you see all of this come together in the, in the fourth century where they're grappling with, with the, the links and tensions really between the, the philosophical and the social. Yeah. And as as one of those categories of people who are unfree um, and sort of brought into the sexual arena, where I'm thinking about pederasty here as 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 something that was um, celebrated. And there, were, there were different forms of it in the Greek world and the Roman world, um, but it, I guess it was Jews like Philo who first kind of wrote it. Were, were there were there any sort of detractors from pederasty sort of prior to Philo? Um, writing and 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 then, so yeah. how, how do Jews and then how do Christians kind of conceive of pederasty? Yeah, I mean there there are, but it's certainly by the time of Philo, it was a first century um, AD Alexandrian Hellenistic, uh, deeply Hellenized Greek um, speaking Jew who's a prominent social figure as well, very interesting philosopher, influenced by Platonism. And so one of the reasons why it is suddenly more visible in Philo is because he wants to synthesize Platonism um, with with his kind of Hebrew moral foundations. And so um, that, that of course, sort of poses the the very specific tension between the the prominence and positive, often positive valence of um, of certain kinds of same-sex eros in the Platonic corpus. for Philo, because he wants to, he wants to praise um, Plato and integrate it with Jewish moral thought, uh, but but that's sort of a point where he doesn't um, reconcile them. But you see him critical of uh, of pederasty in particular. Um, like you say, there are different forms, and we're talking about a huge um, sweep of time. So um, many people will be familiar with the the platonic dialogues and personally i think the the world of classical greece and in that case we're in classical athens is quite different from the the world of the early roman empire um, in lots of ways culturally socially i think for me as a social historian what i what i think is most fundamental probably is just the way in which slavery becomes so fundamentally important in the the Roman world. Of course, the Greeks have slaves, but when Plato's talking about same-sex attraction, it's usually between free people. Um, When most of the the authors in the early Christian, I mean, early Roman period, early imperial period, uh, think about, write about, moralize about um, same-sex attraction, um, it's, it seems like slavery is always there. And so this is a world that does have very different um, beliefs about same-sex love than Christianity or, or modern cultures. Um, but uh, it does seem that, that slavery sort of takes over or is always present. So when 
uh, if a free person in the Roman world um, wants to have same sex homosexual sex they uh, almost universally the sources that, that we have which definitely isn't reflective of, of everybody in a huge uh, complex diverse society um, it seems like again this slavery is always central and a lot of what seems to to take up the the space in these conversations is a conversation about masters exploiting their slaves um, so um, you see that sort of change over the centuries from classical Greece to classical Rome um, and it's a it's a very different world and when the Christians then Christianity spreads and spreads and spreads it's in a world where um, again slavery is really central to cultural conversations about same-sex attraction right right can i ask how uh how unique is this transition how dependent is the modern or the, the, the sort of post this sexual revolution vision of sex sexuality how dependent is it on christian foundations once it's have the revelation the revolution having happened do you think i mean part of my question because i'm just interested in this in, in ordinary life now when you take away all take away the theological foundations mm. which are if all the things you talked about the sort of you know if you were to one by one remove the bricks when would the house fall down but or rather how unique perhaps another way of saying it is how unique is this transition does it happen in other cultures and civilizations in a completely different way are there other sources that get us to this more consent-led rest, respect the dignity of the individual no matter who you are and how honorable you are in society you still have similar sexual rights and restrictions how could that have happened without christianity or did it happen without christianity in other parts of the world or is it all effectively a, an exported version of the Christian sexual revolution that takes place in the period you've been talking about? Well, why don't you ask a big question? Um, <laughs> you tell me, I'm just a Roman historian. Um, I, I think that there seems to me to be something that is deeply, essentially Christian, certainly about the way this, this revolution happens. Um, but it really... The, the values of consent and dignity and the way those um, become fundamental ingredients in liberalism um, seems to me uh, deeply Christian. And it's a good question. It's, that's the right question is, does it happen elsewhere? Could it have happened elsewhere? Um, I think it's, we can certainly imagine ways in which um, other really deeply moral um, philosophies, uh, if they become public morality um, could uh, tend towards these kind of um, fundamental values of, of consent and dignity. Um, but I do think that, that those are the, in many ways, the, the really key terms, the really fundamental um, values that, um, that in many ways separate the, the pre-Christian from the Christian world of antiquity. And, um, I mean, I think that's just in the in the sources. There's there is absolutely a notion of consent um, in Roman law. Um, they're not oblivious to to the meaning of consent, but it's a very muted idea. Um, it's certainly um, not front and center. Whereas um, in Christian culture, that becomes a a really important concept that um, either a person does or does not consent um, to, to certain acts. And then dignity, again, this is rooted right in the, the sources. It's Christian bishops in the, the fourth century who are really shouting. Um, you, know, you don't have to, to look that hard to see them talking about the, the dignity of the individual. You can find traces of it in pre-Christian systems, certainly in Stoicism. Um, but, but you have to look really hard. Um, whereas, you know, the, the axioma, the, the worthiness, the dignity of humans who are created in the image of God, who have freedom, moral freedom, um, who have a rational soul, um, that's, that's really loud and it's really prominent in a way that it hadn't been before. So I think um, the, the way this 
transformation does happen, um, it's it's in very Christian terms. Mm. So something like Me Too, would you say is a, is a has been a profoundly Christian kind of movement? Harvey Weinstein transposed into Rome. Um, his his crimes would be invisible, you know, in that sort of society. And would you see that? Me, me too is testament to something Christian still clinging on in, in, in modern Western society? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you could argue that. Um, I mean, obviously, it, it deserves emphasizing in a way we haven't touched on yet that, um, that there really is something anti-erotic um, about the, the Christian revolution. So just to... Again, to start with language, um, you know, I'm old-fashioned and, and do think we, we could ask, what do the sources say? It's pretty stunning um, that, that eros is not present in the New Testament, right? It's mm-hmm. agape, which is a pretty marginal term until the New Testament. It's a pretty weird word. Um, and, you know, there's just something really deep about that, that eros is not there. Uh, and agape is everywhere. So it's a different, um, fundamentally different model of, of love. And we have to, of course, keep in mind that early Christianity is a deeply ascetic religion. Um, and so, you know, I think in many ways what's going on in modern times is that there's the notion of consent is still prominent. Um, egalitarianism is still fundamental. But there's also a kind of re, um, re- renewal of the positive charge of eros and um, its connection to individual individualism and expressivism in a way that is not um, indebted to to the early Christian revolution. Um, we have to remember, you know, what Paul says in Corinthians is that marriage is permitted. But he says, by way of concession, not of command. He says, I wish all could be as I am, uh, meaning celibate. And the big debate in early Christianity is whether marriage is a um, secondary good to celibacy or a lesser evil to sin. Um, And I mean, this is a live debate right down to the time of Augustine. He writes a book called On the Good of Marriage. um, And he writes that because it was a big issue. Um, and a debated issue among Orthodox Christians into the, the fourth century, whether Paul had let Christians get married um, just because it saved them from porneia, from fornication, this this kind of sin. Um, so, uh, so I do think it, it, it's helpful to to emphasize the the really deep ascetic tendencies in early Christianity. That's again embedded in the Gospels, in the Pauline letters, um, and that, that has worked out over the course of centuries. But the question is even whether Christians should have sex at all, um, even um, within marriage. Yes. And, and therefore, expressive individualism and romanticism kind of comes to the fore. And yeah, the erotic is back, back with a vengeance. <laughs> Um, uh, this has been so helpful, Kyle. Uh, thank you very much. You've got you've got some teaching to do today. Um, okay, Got to go, uh, yeah. go to go and teach. Just all that so helpful, Kyle. Thank you, and thank yeah. you for your work. Just wonderful yeah. on, on on this and on pandemics and others. It's been really great to talk. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful. Well, thank you guys. So, what'd you make of that? It was fascinating. I I think you're so struck on you. He's a remarkable thinker and a very warm guy, and it's just really mm-hmm. a real privilege and yeah. joy to have him on. Um, I I love the I think the duality in a way of of clearly what a modern person and I think he would probably represent this himself would affirm about the Christian Revolution, which is the you know and he kept going back to those two prongs really of sort of the the dignity yes. and the egalitarianism, so the sort of the social leveling that takes place through Christianity yes. and then the the individual dignity, which of course together feed the concept of consent and and that being at the heart of. Uh, the way that we think about sex ever since, but then also the critique, the, the, that which which a modern person would say, which has obviously not come from Christianity, which is, you know, eros bites back, or that kind of. I just yeah. think that comment towards the end about eros and agape is so helpful, yes. and so 
in a way from the perspective of any modern person, any modern Western person who's not a believer, or not a, I can't say that now, can I? Not a Christian <laughs> believer anyway. Yeah. Um, looking at the Christian vision of sex, they may only have, so the Christians will see the, the dignity, consent, piece of the puzzle mm. and the non-christian will probably see the well yeah it's a bit erotically repressive thing you're not you're not just mm. sort of giving you're not celebrating eros as you should and actually of course both are present in the christian revolution and i just mm. thought that analysis particularly at the end of eros and agape together the asceticism of early christianity even as a way of understanding what our culture thinks it's recovering in challenging christian sexual mores more recently right. um, because i think it helps you read our own our own culture and say, ah, oh, yeah, okay, you, you are building on these two Christian insights, but you're also, from your perspective, without recognizing it, you are, but you're also restoring, as you see it, a sort of celebration of the, you know, the naked joys, literally, um, of Eros, as yes. opposed to the agape centered vision of Christianity. And that that tension yes. between, of course, we're going to assume these things to be true, hashtag me too, but yes. we're also going to celebrate all of this stuff and go yes. crazy with whoever you like. and But effectively then try and constrain it simply with the category of consent and effectively use that right. as the, the only rule you have, which is why people would still say to any two consenting adults, knock yourselves out. And I just think that was as a way of analyzing it through the lens of Eros and Agape was a very helpful way of framing it. And it, it certainly um, makes you think harder when somebody says, well, love is love, don't you think? And you're like, well, yeah. well part of the problem is we're speaking English. And yeah. which Greek word are you, are you meaning? Yeah, because agape is eros, don't you think? It clearly doesn't make any sense. I hope not. Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, there are at least four loves that, you know, we, we, it's not storge, it's not philia. But, but um, so that, that is fascinating. And, and this idea that um, sex as a, a breaking of rules and norms and a violation of um, a violation of something that stands above the social strata that we're in and is just wrong is wrong is wrong is wrong if it's abuse um, it just comes comes across so strongly that you know even as Kyle Harper is, is talking about the ancient world he can't help but say well that's exploitation yeah and that's horrible exploitation yeah and and you're like well okay we've we've been thoroughly christianized in that sort of yeah. in that sort of way and yet those sorts of categories were invisible to that culture they were and were brought about th you know through through the christian revolution and th the other thing that struck me is is you know i i quoted that line to him which i'm always you know talking about the, the um all, all the world's diffuse erotic energy was cramped into this frail sacred union. Um, and in a sense, the, the 1960s kind of let the genie out of the bottle again. Mm. Um, one way of telling the story is that the first century sexual revolution said men must be as restricted as women have always been. Yeah. And it attacked the double standard from that level. Yeah, and the 20th century ones. The 20th century, now women can be as liberated as men have always been. But then you get the Louise Perrys of this world saying, well, but, but now everyone has to play the male game, yeah. the male-dominated game. Exactly. And, and men, on average, you know, have, have different yeah, desires. Social sexuality is much higher and therefore prom tendency to promiscuity is higher. People find yeah. you've got far less, at, far less at stake in your sexual proclivities than a yes. woman does because you're not going to give birth to a child at the end of it. And so the whole sexual economy gets designed around effectively yeah. Powerful men, yes. Um, which I think, in, again, sorry to keep toggling back to the 18th century, but that's of course what that one of the things that's going on even in the modern sexual revolution is that it's really the 1960s is really the the going mainstream of trends that were beginning that are, were 200 years old, really. That people yeah. that, from the 18th century beginning to go, well, of course, men can do this, this, and this, and challenge all these Christian sexual restrictions more and more. In fact, you see some of that even back in the time of someone like Shakespeare or mm -hmm. John Donne or people like that. Mm -hmm. And then it comes, but it it gets becomes certainly something that powerful men can do and what happens in the 1960s is that then it gets it sort of snowballs into the culture as a whole after a, a series of little mini sexual revolutions rumbling away yep. in the 20s and so on and then the technology shock of constant exactly and it then yep. makes it yep. easy to do it without the downsides or yep. the consequences as at least as yep. it's framed and so it becomes a, f a much more widespread phenomenon but at its heart the, the, yep. at a sort of ideological conceptual level that change has already been made but yep. it's just still got huge costs for certain people and what happens today 
way is we pretend that those costs no longer exist. And and even with through a mixture of contraception or abortive, whatever, we are trying to go, no, no, there's no downside, there's nothing to see here. And pornography is just, it's not, you know, it's a sort of consenting person and a consenting viewer yeah. and what's the problem? Yeah. And as you say, I, I found Louise Perry very helpful on that. She's not the only one saying it, but it's very helpful to think, no, there is there are a lot more acts of exploitation and destruction. It's one of the reasons why abortion would be sidelined so much. And we don't, we don't want to see it, don't want to talk about it, don't want to be aware that of what it is even. And it's certainly why we would, wouldn't even want to have a conversation about contraceptive methods and, and some of the victims in pornography, because it's to, it's to put back in the center of the screen the fact that there is still exploitation going on. There is still the powerful and the powerless, that dynamic's still there. And there remains, therefore, a tension between eros unchained mm -hmm. and consent and dignity. And that 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 is built into, it's effectively is built into the way we are. Because yes. if, if I have sex with anybody I want to, that's sometimes going to have destructive consequences on the, those people. Yeah. Similarly, if I don't, I am constraining my own sexual freedom. And of course, the Christians have said yes to the second of those. That is what yeah. you should do. Yeah. And the 1960s wanted to say no to those things. But we've seen what happens when that overreaches and eats itself. So, yeah. yeah, I just thought it was a fascinating interview. And wasn't it fascinating that he said that sort of libertarian free will was born in in the struggle for the early church to express itself in, in chastity? Yeah, actually. I was really interested because I've not I've not heard that before. They, yeah. I didn't know yeah. actually. I feel yeah. bad that I, I maybe I should have yeah. known this. Maybe you knew it. But the idea that Christians were the first to even use the term free will, right. but the, but the fact that that is actually a big part of the sexual story because yes. obviously partly free will means I powerful male can control my desires. <laughs> yes. But it yeah. also means that you, subservient in society's eyes, slave, woman, child, have free will, which means you, right. you have agency to, to yes. resist me. And yes. so the free will cuts both ways, both yes. and both times in defense of sexual restrictions and yes. yeah. and and consent. And I just yeah, I'd never seen that. Yeah. So that was a bit of a light bulb. Yeah, freedom is expressed not in free love in the 1960s sense, but in the sense that I'm free from a necessity. Yes, I'm not a slave to, to my sexual passions. Right, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so actually virgins and martyrs in the early church are teaching a fatalistic culture. Yeah. You can resist the biological urge for survival and sex. Yeah. You can, you can be a martyr. Yeah. <laughs> be free, be a martyr, be free, be yeah. a virgin. And that, and therefore, yeah, that I that, that could be a um, Virgin Atlantic's next campaign. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it it, it is a, just a a re that was a very interesting. I, yeah. I I guess I'd seen it on on one side, but not on the other as well. I hadn't thought free right. will as a category for understanding that yeah. sexual revolution is fascinating. And then, I mean, where where the book gets to gels very nicely with. Um, Joseph Henrik and the weirdest people in the world, and, yeah. and Joseph Henrik writes in a in a more um, direct kind of way. So where Karl Harper talks about uh, all the diffuse erotic energy being cramped into the, into that frail sacred union, he talks about the the church reached down and grabbed men by the testicles, yes. right? Yeah, um, and for the absolute blessing yeah. of the West, and 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 Kyle gets into it, and obviously Joseph Henrik's like whole book is about that, but that actually unleashing free love in the erotic sense yeah. um, uh, has been a, a dangerous, wild experiment. Yeah. <laughs> but constraining male sexuality, especially male sexuality, mm. um, has been for the blessing and fruitfulness you know, of the yeah. world. And, and you see people like Louise Perry and Mary Harrington yeah. and others sort of rediscovering that. Um, yeah. You do, and it would be interesting to see, maybe in 100 years' time, an, an equivalent podcast of this mm. uh, could look back at the impact of that on some of the wider sort of economic and political fallout of the sexual revolution, as in, so mm -hmm. if you chain male sexual energy in that you constrain it, it's probably a better, slightly less pejorative <laughs> term, but you constrain it and you yeah. channel it into this particular way, yeah. these are some of the benefits that have come, as in Henrich's work, as you say. Yeah. But the opposite is also true, that if you just allow it to run amok with anybody any which way, you wonder, so what are the some of the economic impacts of what that does to families and what that does to male identity and what that does to female identity and what it does to yeah. you know fertility and therefore what it does in the end to the health and civilization and the aging of a society and demographic trends and yeah. you know the future belongs to the fertile you realize all of these things are actually offshoots of yeah. the demographic transition and the and the sexual revolution that is connected with it and you wonder in 200 years time would people look back at this th these generations we've lived through and say oh that was when things really started to go wrong for the west because 
because that was where they, the actual things that make the society strong, although they still had a lot of money, yeah. but actually now we can look back and see that was where it started to go wrong yeah. because effectively they, they gave up on those things in order to allow sexual desire to go wherever it wanted again. And it backfired. I, I, who knows? Obviously, it's too soon to say. But I, I think you can see some hints of some of those trends. Yes. You know, very well established as of the you know the early twenty twenties. And final question: Like, what, what does it make you think as an evangelist and an apologist into this culture? Because I, I think, if we wound back the clock fifteen years, I wouldn't want to talk about sex and all that kind of stuff. I would, I would yeah. say it's it's a totally fringe issue. It's all about Jesus. And there, there might be a chapter at the end of the book in a little FAQ section yeah, about yeah. it. And yet, I mean, what Kyle was saying is in, in the first century, mm. front and center, and people were like shocked by how much yeah. Christians were wanting to talk about this issue. Are we back in that kind of yeah. culture where sex becomes more more prominent? I think we are. I mean, I, when I first started preaching in 2005 or six, I mean, we did a series called Sex in the City. You know, it was a very, mm. it sounded on trend at the time. It doesn't now. <laughs> um, and, uh, based on 1 Corinthians 5 to 7. And it was one of the first major series I did in sort of late, I guess, in my late 20s. And as you realize the apologetic power of even then of you know 15 years back of preaching into sexual ethics as a means partly of engaging attention partly it's one of the mm. things that the world is still going i actually would i am interested in talking about that subject i i don't share your presuppositions about it but i definitely want to talk about it which is not true of many areas of biblical theology and ethics but simultaneously i think what you realize how Christocentric the Christian sexual apologetic is and has to be if it's to make any headway at all because the more post-Christian society becomes or the more leaving Christianity behind society does the less easy it is to just give people the rules and the more you have to show people the theological grammar within which the world the rules make sense so you have to go to Ephesians 5 you have to go to Genesis 1 and 2 Revelation 21 and 22 because people otherwise say yes but why is that the rule why do you limit sex in that way why is sex within marriage and you, you you start telling the bigger story of Christ right. and the church, of right. heaven and earth being united, of the worshipping one God rather than many and having one sexual partner who's not like you versus many who might be. And you start have to tell those big stories in order to make any of it make sense. But that, in a way, then means that you're able to use sex and marriage as an apologetic tool. They become, you're, you're leaning into them because you realise this is actually a, an opportunity rather than something I'm hoping never comes up. Right. Um, and that's certainly been my experience. You occasionally get into trouble as well. But yeah. I think it, it enables uh, all sorts of openings for gospel conversations that would probably not have been available at the start of the century. And I, I think, again, I'm yes. always the optimist, but I, I, I think there's lots of opportunities there in yes. what I call sexual apologetics. I yes. think it's a, a yes. great gift to us. I, I agree. And I think the apologetics of the early church would, would sort of bear that out yeah. if, we, if we see how they address the topic. Well, that'll do for now. We are also going to, uh, in our series, uh, interview Carl Truman. Uh, as uh, we look at how we've gone from a Christian to a post-Christian kind of sexual ethic. And he'll have plenty to say, the author of The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. Uh, that'll do for now. If you uh, are listening to this on a podcast, why don't you give us a rating and a review? Make sure you're subscribed to the channel. We'd love to keep you updated with all the stuff that is coming. If you're watching on YouTube, then why don't you click like and subscribe? And why don't you share on social media? We'd love to get the word out there uh, that more people can enjoy post-Christianity. But uh, Andrew Wilson, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Claire.